I am so glad you're here because in this video we're going to be talking all about multi-step synthesis. This video is part two of a previous video where we began our discussion about multi-step synthesis and using retrosynthetic analysis to solve complex synthesis problems like converting one reactant to another. Using the retrosynthetic analysis approach, we can convert in the backwards direction from D to C to B to A, and I'm going to show you all the tips and tricks you need to succeed on your exams. Recall from the previous video, we left these two synthetic approaches unsolved. So if you haven't had a chance yet, pause the video, try these problems independently, and then resume this video to check your answers. For the first question, you've been tasked with turning this five-membered ring into a fused ring system that also contains this six-membered ring. In addition, we see that we have several different functional groups that are present on the product that are not present on the reactant. Therefore, I know that I I will use both of our tips for devising a retrosynthetic analysis plan. Specifically, we're going to be looking at what methods we know to make new carbon-carbon bonds and what methods we know that allow us to do a functional group transformation to achieve our product. Because this is a fused ring system, I recall from our discussion on Claisen condensations, which you can view here, what is known as Robinson annulation, which allows us to make new fused rings using Claisen condensations or specifically generating enols and enolates to do Michael additions or 1, 2, and 1, 4 additions. Specifically, this will allow us to achieve one of those carbon-carbon bond forming reactions where we can generate this fused ring system. Specifically, I'm going to be looking at adjoining this five-membered ring to a system or a reactant that contains one, two, three, four carbons because our new bonds being formed are attached to the five-membered ring. So I need four carbons in order to achieve this. And generally for these one, two, and one, four addition reactions, we need to use what's called a Michael acceptor. One of the most common ones is going to be this type of ketone, which contains a double bond here where we can do a Michael addition or one, two, or one, four addition. And remember in these reactions, you're performing an enolate, which means that our starting material which our other reactant, which also contained this five-membered ring, likely needs to contain a carbonyl functional group in order to generate the enolate species, which will allow us to do this bond-forming reaction. Therefore, I see that two of the reactants that I could use to generate that reactant using our retrosynthetic analysis approach is going to be what is likely to be this system. And remember, when performing these reactions, the most common type of base that you use to form the enolates is LDA or lithium diisopropyl amide. But it also may be possible to use something like sodium ethoxide. And this is just a quick review of those Michael addition reactions and what is happening when you do this Michael addition. Therefore, since these reactants are going to be introduced at this later step, that means that one of our previous steps must have formed this five-membered ring with the ketone on it. So a functional group transformation, now I know that I can form a ketone by using an oxidizing agent similar to something like PCC. So PCC allows us to turn alcohols into ketones. That means that my previous step likely was that oxidation where you have an alcohol at this carbon position, which gets oxidized to PCC. Now we know several ways to generate alcohols from different functional groups. And what I need to notice is that this alcohol is on the less substituted carbon. This lets me know that the method used to make an alcohol needs to add in an anti-Markovnikov fashion. And the only method that I know to generate an alcohol in an anti-Markovnikov fashion is going to be hydroboration oxidation, which means that my reagents were likely BH3 and H2O2, this peroxide, which will allow us to do the hydroboracin oxidation of an alkene, which means that an alkene was likely my previous step where the alkene is here and the oxidation, hydroboration oxidation was occurring at this carbon position to make this alcohol. Now, the only way that I know to make alkenes are through elimination reactions, which means that previously there must have been something like an alkyl halide, which would undergo either an E1 or an E2 elimination to form that alkene which lets me know that my previous starting material must have been that alkyl halide. So if I know that, that an elimination reaction has occurred, then if there was a bromine at this position, that I could do a functional group transformation to turn this alkyl bromide into an alkene. Now importantly, I see a method where I could turn this alkyl bromide into my original starting material working backwards, and that is by brominating in an anti-Markovnikov fashion. And remember that in order to brominate in an anti-Markovnikov fashion, which will place the bromine on the less substituted alkyl chain, then I needed to use something that would generate a radical. So in this case, it could be Br2 
in the presence of H nu. So this is going to generate a bromine radical, which will add anti-Markovnikov. Subsequently, we do elimination to generate the alkene. Then we can turn our alkene into an alcohol using hydroboration oxidation. Subsequently, we oxidize the alcohol to a ketone. And then we can do use our Michael addition reaction to do a Robinson annulation to form this fused membered ring. Now let's take a look at what this might look like in the forward direction. In the forwards direction, we begin by brominating at the anti-Markovnikov carbon chain in order to generate our alkyl bromide. And remember that in order to do this, we needed to use a reagent like bromine in the presence of light or H nu. From here, we can do an elimination reaction, ensuring that we're forming the alkene at this position. And in order to do that, we could use something like sodium ethoxide in order to generate our brand new alkene at this position. From here, we would do hydroboration oxidation, which is going to be BH3. And then subsequently, in our second step, we need H2O2 and water in order to place our alcohol at the less substituted carbon position. And in order to do that, we place the alcohol here. At this stage, we oxidize our alcohol using PCC, which is an oxidizing agent that will allow us to turn alcohols into ketones. And then from here, we need to add our Michael acceptor, which again is this double bond with the ketone. And we need to add a base like sodium ethoxide to generate our enolate species. And we can also add another base like sodium hydroxide in order to do this Robinson annulation, which will give us our final product. As you saw in the last problem, I'm using the same tips and tricks that we've learned about in the last video to generate our multi-step synthesis. Namely, that includes what methods are used to make new carbon-carbon bonds and are we using them in this multi-step synthesis, which hopefully you recognize as being immediately obvious since our starting material contains two carbons and our final product contains several more carbons. Secondly, I'm always looking for the different functional group transformations that may be occurring in order to turn an alkyne into several of these other functional groups. Specifically, how can we generate alcohols, epoxides, and new five-membered rings? Importantly, one of the only the only way that I know to generate epoxides is using a reagent like MCBPA to turn an alkene into an epoxide. This is the only method I know in order to do this functional group transformation. Therefore, I know that I'm likely to encounter this step at some point in time in my synthesis, which also means I will need to generate an alkene, likely through elimination or through reducing an alkyne into an alkene. Therefore, that's where I'm actually going to start, because I also know that epoxides are readily susceptible to nucleophilic attack. It's likely that this is going to be our very last step. So using the retrosynthetic analysis approach, I can put an alkene here and say, okay, well, that must have been my step where I generated the epoxide. So for example, if this was an alkene, then I know that I could add MCPPA in order to generate this brand new epoxide, which means I will need MCBPA in the presence of this alkene, and that is likely to be my final step in my retrosynthetic analysis. Importantly, what you should notice is this is a trans alkene, and there are two different ways to reduce alkynes to alkenes. Using Lindler's catalyst allows us to generate cis alkenes, but using sodium and ammonia, we can generate trans alkenes. So both of these are going in opposite directions, the substituents off of the alkene. Therefore, it's likely that I'm using sodium and ammonia which means that my previous reactant, or the step before this, must have been this same molecule containing the alcohol. However, there was an alkyne at this position, which we added sodium and ammonia to generate the trans alkene, which means that the rest of this molecule was still present with our five-membered ring already on it. So this was the previous step going from this alkyne to this alkene using sodium and ammonia. At this stage, the next functional group transformation that I see is the presence of this alcohol. Importantly, it is connected to a carbon that is adjacent to an alkyne. And previously, we have learned about nucleophilic addition reactions, where if you, in the presence of a nucleophilic Nucleophile, you can generate new alcohols by doing nucleophilic acyl substitution, which would allow us to generate an alcohol. Now, importantly, I know of a method where I can turn an alkyne into a nucleophile, and that is one of those methods to generate new carbon-carbon bonds. In the presence of a strong base, like NaNH2, 
I know that I can deprotonate an alkyne and now it will act as a nucleophile. Therefore, if the alkyne was the nucleophile, then the rest of this component was likely to be an aldehyde or a ketone. Specifically, if we would think about the previous step and we considered the fact that we had the alkyne already, that means that that alkyne likely look like this, which already contained the five-membered ring, in the presence of that strong base, so sodium NH2, and the other reactant that it must have reacted with would have been the aldehyde, which would undergo a nucleophilic acyl substitution to generate this new alcohol. And in fact, I know that I can use that same method to form this rest of the piece of the alkyne in order to work my way backwards to our original starting material. So therefore, the previous step must have also used sodium NH2 in order to do that carbon-carbon bond formation where you deprotonate the alkyne and it acts as a nucleophile. Specifically, it can do substitution reactions of alkyl bromides which means that the remaining component of my molecule must have been an alkyl bromide. Therefore, the other starting material besides this alkyne must have been that five-membered ring that contained an alkyl bromide. Now let's work our way from the reactants to the products in the forward direction. Remember that the first step is going to be this alkyne reacting with that alkyl bromide, specifically the five-membered ring with the bromine on it. And don't forget, you still need that strong base to deprotonate the hydrogen that is present on this carbon. So I need sodium NH2 to act as that strong base to form our new carbon-carbon bond, which will give us the product, which contains now that five-membered ring on it and that CH2 group. From here, remember the next step was nucleophilic acyl substitution with that aldehyde, as well as generating the nucleophilic alkyne at this hydrogen position, which means that the first step must have been the addition of sodium NH2. So now we can form our next step, which is gonna contain that alkyne also connected to the rest of our alcohol. So from here, I see that now I have my alkyne. I also contain my five-membered ring. And from here, the next step was to form a transalkene. And forming a transalkene is done in the presence of sodium, and ammonia to make our transalkene, giving us a familiar alkene in order to subsequently generate our epoxide using MCPBA, which means that the last step is that addition of MCBPA to do the epoxidation at this alkene. Let's try one last problem using material learned in organic chemistry too. Pause the video, try this problem independently, then resume the video to check your understanding. For the last problem, we are tasked with turning two different groups into a single product, and notably, we are going to need to add several different carbon-carbon bond-forming reactions. Specifically, anytime I see one of these boronate esters, I know that this is likely a Suzuki coupling. So the Suzuki coupling is a palladium-mediated catalysis in which we can turn aryl or vinyl halides into new carbon-carbon bonds using the other coupling reagent which contains this boron-containing species. And that is going to allow us to form one of our new carbon-carbon bonds. Additionally, I see that there is another carbon on the other end of one of the aryl rings with which I need to generate. Specifically, this is going to create a benzyl alcohol. And one of the transformations that I know that can generate this benzyl alcohol is going to be turning carboxylic acids into alcohols. So that is going to be one of our transformations with which we can do as part of our functional group transformation. So now we've identified some carbon-carbon bond forming reactions, and in addition to that, some of our functional group transformations. Now importantly, we need to start at the end for our retrosynthetic analysis. So it's likely that in order to do this functional group transformation, the previous starting material must have been a carboxylic acid, which means my new carbon-carbon bond that adjoins the two aryl groups must have already formed. So this must be a carboxylic acid. And I know that I can turn carboxylic acids into primary alcohols using lithium aluminum hydride, or LIH, LAH for short. And this is going to allow us to do this functional group transformation described here. That means that I needed to do a functional group transformation to actually generate this carboxylic acid. And one of the methods that I know to do that is one of those benzylic reactions where you can turn any sort of benzylic carbon into a carboxylic acid by doing an oxidation. So that can turn an alkyl group that contains at least one carbon hydrogen atom bond into a carboxylic acid. And that process then is going to allow us to generate that carboxylic acid, which means that 
I previously had something on here that contained a carbon-hydrogen bond. Specifically, it could be like this isopropyl group. And in the presence of KMnO4, I can perform an oxidation to convert an alkyl benzylic alkyl chain into a carboxylic acid. Now remember, in order to generate this new carbon-carbon bond between this aryl organoboron species and this aryl group, I needed to do a Suzuki coupling, which means that I could form our new carbon-carbon bond if this portion was an aryl halide, like an aryl bromide. So that means that I needed to generate our aryl bromide previously. So I will place the alkyl group here, and at the para position needs to be a bromide, and adjoining this species with this species together using palladium tetricus, for example, or triphenylphosphine, where there are four of them, in the presence of both of these reagents will allow us to transform it to this group. So then what must have occurred before then is generating this aryl bromide, and I see that at the para position is an alkyl group, and previously we learned about electrophilic aromatic substitution reactions, which I'll link here, to place bromine para to an alkyl group using electrophilic aromatic substitution. So that means that the previous reagent must have been this alkyl group and in the, in the presence of bromine and iron bromide, you can do a bromination at the para position, which is the favored product in these electrophilic aromatic substitution reactions. And then from here, I see that the last step in order to generate this alkyl bromide must have been another electrophilic aromatic substitution reactions in that same video, where you can generate this starting, this starting material if you had done a friedel crafts alkylation. So that friedel crafts alkylation would have been something like an alkyl bromide in the presence of a Lewis acid, like again, that iron bromide, and then adding that to a benzene molecule allows us to alkylate at this position in order to generate this product. Now working in the forward direction, remember the very first step is to alkylate this benzene ring to generate our alkylated product which contains this isopropyl group. And we did that, remember, via the addition of an alkyl bromide in the presence of that Lewis acid, iron tribromide. From here, the next step was to brominate at the para position. And since this alkyl group is an ortho para director, the major product of this reaction is going to be that para bromination if we use Br2 in the presence of that same Lewis acid iron tribromide. And then from here, our two starting materials combine to make our new carbon-carbon bond that's formed at this position via what is called a Suzuki coupling, which uses triphenylphosphine, four triphenylphosphine palladium reactions to do that Suzuki coupling. And again, the Suzuki coupling we covered previously in this video. That generates our new carbon-carbon bond between the two aryl groups which now contains just that alkyl chain coming off the other side, which remember we can turn into a carboxylic acid by oxidizing this carbon hydrogen bond that's present here by using KMnO4 or potassium permanganate to generate our new species, which contains both of the aryl rings, and now a carboxylic acid at this position with which we can turn into a primary alcohol via the addition of lithium, aluminum, hydride. Now importantly, remember, we used all of these steps by generating first, starting at the end, using retrosynthetic analysis to work our way backwards, and then coming back and working in the forward direction to generate our full scheme. In this playlist, you can find all of the different reactions that we talked about in this video, including functional group transformations and carbon-carbon bond forming reactions. If you ever need to go back, I highly recommend checking out those videos. So make sure to like this video, comment down below if you have any questions, and subscribe to my channel for more chemistry content. I'll see you in the next video.